Hi oh, hey everyone, I, I am Katrina. I work at Portal Ventures an Investment Partner. We do a pre-seed first check investment and based out of New York. We have a very keen interest in BTC ecosystem, which is why I'm here. And uh, thank you, Sora, for putting together such a great uh, conference. And I'm ex particularly excited to moderate this panel because we literally got some of the most prominent and active investors at the core of the BTC ecosystem. Uh, gotta say, I'm expecting a lot of alpha coming out of this, and no pressure, guys. All right, um, I don't think they actually need intro, but let's do one round robin anyways. Let's um, answer the question of what you do at your firm and um, what got you into the BTC ecosystem. Let's start with uh, actually the host, Jason, and then we'll pass to Tyler. Um, so I'm Jason, I'm the founder of Sora Ventures. So we've been in business since 2018. Uh, our, our primary focus has always been capturing alpha. Um, so we, we invest in the early narrative around NFT game five when the term game five wasn't even out. Um, and uh, we have two funds now and fund two primarily focus on DeSci and Bitcoin. Um, and basically, you know, we got involved in Bitcoin relatively early in Q1 of this year. Um, I have been investing nonstop. So, you know, this is also one of the reasons why we want to share Bitcoin, the upside with you guys. Thanks, Jason, uh, and thanks for having us all here. My name is Tyler Evans. I am uh, one of the founders of BTC Inc., which is the media group that publishes Bitcoin Magazine and runs the Bitcoin conference uh, in the US, in Europe, and hopefully coming soon to Asia. So I um, have been in the Bitcoin space uh, a long, long time. It's actually been a full decade that I've been working uh, primarily in Bitcoin. So, um, you know, been, been on the media side, uh, played in all sorts of the crypto games, kind of refocused our business on Bitcoin in 2018. And I gotta say, uh, this last year has been the most fun year I've had in Bitcoin. Kevin, you wanna go next? Sure, um, I don't know how I'm gonna follow that up, but uh, I'm Kevin, I'm deal partner at the Bitcoin Frontier Fund. We're one of the most active early stage Bitcoin VCs. Um, we have an accelerator as well, where a bunch of the companies that have already been on stage here today have actually graduated from our accelerator program. So far to date, we've uh, invested in over 50 companies, which is absolutely exciting, and we're very excited to be investing in a lot more. For me personally, I got into Bitcoin and Ethereum way back in 2017, and I made my very first purchase, I was just actually looking yesterday, on Gemini, like way back in the day. Um, and I'm just very excited to see where everything is going with the Bitcoin space, and uh, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I guess I'll go. I'm, I'm Jason. I'm a Chief Innovation Officer at OKX. We're not a VC. We're a crypto platform. We're a crypto exchange as well as we have a Web3 wallet. Uh, we work with a lot of VCs as well as your portfolio companies. I think our objective is to bring access to all the cool stuff that you guys are investing in, all the cool stuff that you guys are building, and bring it to the market, right? We want to make sure that users have a very easy seamless way to access uh, across the ecosystem, but particularly Bitcoin um, protocols and uh, projects. Uh, for us as a company, uh, we this is our 10th year also, uh, and I guess that makes us, uh, having been in the ten Bitcoin space for 10 years now, uh, I've been with the company for a little over seven years, and uh, we've been prolific supporters, uh, we think, of the Bitcoin ecosystem broadly. Um, but yeah, this year certainly one of the most exciting ones, so uh, happy to chat more later. Speaking of excitement, where are we in the cycle? Are we really, we're back, we're so back? What's happening here? Um, Tyler, do you wanna get started? I mean, I think the, the party's not even getting started uh, for, for Bitcoin as a whole. You know, I think uh, kind of the analogy I, I like to use is that, um, you know, Bitcoin has its four year halving cycles, which is almost like the long term debt cycle in an economy. And then uh, the ordinals, BRC20 ecosystem, moves on its own own uh, timeline, which is greatly, greatly accelerated. So it's more like the short-term debt cycle, and I think right now we're at one of those magical periods where uh, both of them are, are combining and, and going up and to the right, um, which is why this past month's been so much fun. Uh, but I, I don't think it's gonna be up and to the right only, especially uh, in, in the more volatile high beta assets uh, like the BRC20, so, um, you know. But uh, enjoy it while it lasts. Do you guys agree with that? 100%. 
Um, I, I think this is probably one of the most expensive times in, in, in Web3 in the sense that it really does feel like the early days of Ethereum, uh, where developers are just coming in, building stuff, and the market, they don't do any marketing, and people just start like you know getting involved, buying the tokens, and it's going up. I mean, the only thing we trade in our office today is BRC20, right? That's that's the only thing we do, right? And so like, um, and when we do research on a lot of our investment, the first thing we fundamentally, fundamentally look at is how big is that community, right? And how do they even grow their community? What, what is surprising um, that this kind of aligns with the earliest Ethereum is that there are companies out there who does zero marketing, um, doesn't even have a team that speaks you know, the local language, and these different jurisdictions is picking up. Like, for example, like mainland China is picking up like crazy. Uh, we made investments in companies that didn't have someone who speaks Chinese, and it's like 90% of the community comes from China. And we asked them, like, how, like, like, what, wait, how did this even happen? It's like, uh, we don't know. Like, this has happened, <laughs> right? So like, that's when you know that there is so much demand in the market, um, and, and there's just so little supply, which means that there's so much upside, all right? And then people who's been investing in this, in, in this category will probably agree that, okay, first you have memes, and then you have like a transition into utility. So I mean, upside's insane. Yeah, I think we're we're super super early, um, and I'm gonna view this from like uh, a trading and like investment perspective. Um, I've done a lot of crypto trading, and I always follow some of these really big like crypto trader accounts, like Trader SE, Trader XO. I don't know if anybody follows any of those accounts. And usually, my signal is if they're not tweeting about something, you should be buying. And only until recently are they tweeting charts about Ordi, which is like just starting to kind of bring Ordi just as a BRC20 token itself specifically into the mass market. So I think a lot of Bitcoin enjoyers are obviously very bullish, but the common everyday person is not even aware of what is currently happening. We went from things being denominated in Ethereum to now everything being denominated into Bitcoin. And it's just super exciting that that is the case. I think um, obviously you guys are all VCs and heavily invested in making sure this goes up. Um, so we should all take uh, with a grain of salt. But from our perspective, we've been seeing some very interesting data, uh, actually. You know, our, our Web3 wallet is, is one of the earlier supporters. Uh, uh, we added support for the ordinal space pretty early. And recently, we've been noticing, um, I think to Jason's point about uh, you know, pockets of interest where you least expect it. We've been seeing us users in Africa really diving into uh, Bitcoin ordinals specifically. And that, I asked the team, I was like, what's going on here? Uh, and we're, we're still trying to dive deeper in. So it, it is a bit bizarre and you know, maybe signs of uh, good things to come. Um, but yeah, it's certainly a, a very, very exciting times. Love it, love it. Um, that's actually a good segue into exactly what are the segments that will drive these excitement, especially going into the future. So let's parse it into a two side of conversation. One is more consumer facing layer and the other one more infrastructure layer. So I actually want to toss the first question to Jason because uh, two days ago you just got, uh, just launched uh, the announcement of OCM uh, NFT project and you've been kind of spearheading a lot of the ordinal NFT project investment. Um, want to see where you see the ordinal NFT space specifically is going and um, how does that resemble or let's say converge or diverge from the Ethereum NFT space? Yeah. Um, so this aligns with the macro of where we're heading in terms of Web3. So as most of you guys know, um, the Bitcoin ETF will most likely get approved at some point. Um, and that on a, on a very basic level is just you know, speculation. There's gonna be more speculation around, there's gonna be more interest in Bitcoin. But from a venture perspective, you're asking one question. What if I'm a, what if I'm a, I'm a venture capitalist right? Um, from Web2? What's my involvement in Web3? Right? And now that Bitcoin ETF is becoming, uh, you know, getting approved, they also want a piece of it, right? And so um, when, when this happens, we as Web3 investors also ask ourselves, what is the next level in NFTs, right? With the first level, obviously, we've seen with Azuki, with Bored Ape, uh, where the, the asset is, you know, asset is like pointed towards like a, a decentralized server, for example, like IPFS. Um, but then you ask yourself, like, what's the next, le next level of that? And, Again, 
the, when we were first investing into OCM, you know, we noticed that, okay, you can put everything on chain, so all the asset holds all the properties of, of blockchain. That's great. What about the next like, level? Like, what else can you put other than art, right? And some things I think is kind of crazy, but there, there is, from what I know, is that brands who are serious, just, just in general, like, these are non-Web3 companies. Brands who are serious about putting serious asset on Web3 will care more about the security and their perception of which, play, which blockchain to use than, than, than a lot of developers. That, that's the difference between, for example, Bugatti actually launched um, on, on Ornos, on Bitcoin. Why do you think Bugatti will do that? Well, Bugatti is the best of the best in the car industry. They want to associate themselves as you know, being the best. Yes, Ethereum is secured, and most will probably argue that it's secure enough, but for, for a lot of players, like this is not enough. We want to be in the best. So if you can relate that to the car industry, you can relate to a hundred things or a thousand things out there in, in, this, in this world, where when they look at on-chain asset, when they look at digital asset, it's going to be on Bitcoin. Exactly, and we actually had this uh, conversation in private as well. Just like when you buy a sunglasses, it's all polarized, right? You can buy from Gucci, you can buy from Ray-Ban, you can also buy from a convenience store. They all do the same thing, well, more or less, but there's a brand association with it. Um, cool, well, also on the application layer, Jason, well, we have two Jasons, so Jason squared, but the other Jason, um, on the exchange side, you have a lot of data on the consumer behavior and kind of what people are interested in. So tell us more, um, and especially around like, I mean, it takes a lot to be the first mover, a lot of conviction, and actually the detection of the signal to, to act on it. So what made you decide to you know, make BRC one of the core strategy and how did you execute? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, we were not the first. I think there are, uh, there are always people ahead of you and we gotta give credit where it's due. There's a lot of people that created uh, earlier marketplaces. Where we took an approach was that our Web3 wallet is a multi-chain wallet. It does obviously support Bitcoin and the Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, Bitcoin ecosystem, including layer twos like Stats and, and others. Um, but more importantly, what we saw was that um, you know users actually came to us first and kind of brought up you know the the, the topic of ordinals and, and how do you uh, what do you guys think about it? And we took a deeper dive, much like maybe some VC analysis that you guys might do. Look at the market size. Look at the 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 uh, uniqueness of this of this space and. Yeah, we, we, we took a stab at it. You know, it was challenging. I think we the builders here know how challenging uh, building on, uh, you, you know, using uh, ordinals and then BRC 20s later, uh, to, to protocol later. Um, it's very different from what, what other uh, protocols, especially NFT marketplaces and things like that, have, have uh, come out with. So we've been iterating through. I mean, it's only been, I don't know, nine months since we've launched. Um, you know, early early days, the the failure rates were high, just super clunky. I think we've gone to a decent spot, but to be fair, I think the user experience still has a lot of work. Uh, so we're working on it. I think we're we're in the early innings. Um, There's yeah. always work to be done at UX, of course. Um, yeah, and the good thing is we're we're continuously doing it. Um, okay, veering the conversation more into infra layer, uh, I want to toss a question to Kevin. Why don't you kind of give us the lay of the land of the various approach happening here? I mean, we had multiple announcements this morning around standards, room coming out, L2 solutions, ZK rollups, and different approach. Kind of help us out here. Um, it's a lot, I know. That's I know, it's a super spot. loaded question. So let me take the, the token approach first, and then somebody else can jump in. Um, I think the, the OG in the token approach is obviously BRC20, and then from there, a lot of other players started to look at kind of what uh, what was created and try to take a stab at doing something slightly different. So I think now, today where we are, we have BRC20, we have TAP, Pipe, we have Stamps, which is now starting to take off. Um, we have Taproot Assets, we have RGB, and then we've got Layer 2s. We've got Stacks, Rootstock, etc. There's a lot of options. I think today compared to before. And you gotta add like Cyborg, BRC100, like <laughs> yes, the, yes. the new super DJ. Super, one super DJ was, yes. And then you have to really understand, I, I think from like a founder's perspective, I think it's what's gonna be the most important thing next, right? There has been some sort of validation on the BRC20 side from centralized exchanges being able to list BRC20s. Um, I think that was the very first step. 
that's what made everybody realize, I think that there's something here and we, to, we need to actually look at it a little bit more closely. But now what's happening is founders that have started companies that previously didn't have that stamp of approval and validation from centralized exchanges are now realizing that with that stamp of approval, we may launch a token, right? This is the major inflection point to me because what this means is that founders now have a multitude of options of where they can launch their tokens. So now all of these standards and protocols are actually competing against each other to ensure that they can capture this potential new upcoming utility token, this new token of this protocol, this app that is awesome. And I think that this is like the inflection point to me personally of where we're gonna start seeing liquidity flow from one standard to the other is dependent on where the founders are going to actually launch their tokens. Do you guys agree? But how do I choose? Like, there, there are many standards, and if you were a founder, how would you guys choose? You know, li liquidity begets liquidity, I think, is what, yeah, what we Marcus yeah. speaks for. learned from the, the crypto ecosystem. And, you know, for, for a long time, I always thought, like, narrative drove price in crypto, and, and now I've done a total 180, and it's really price that creates narratives around people trying to explain why things are going up. So you just look where the, the X's are the highest, and that's where people are gonna gravitate, because uh, the momentum from that and from the recirculation of capital flows, as you have many projects in an ecosystem appreciating rapidly, that's what everyone's looking for. I honestly think there's two sides to that. There's like the developer side, um, the community side, but then the most important part is actually ultimately the exchange side, right? I mean, when we were investing, it's like, you know, like they were still working on it. And honestly, whatever Jason is saying, it's like he's just being way too humble because to my knowledge, like number one basically in China right now in terms of user base, right? Yeah, so it's insane. I mean, the amount of growth they've gotten, it's like, it's just insane. And but. Obviously the support also is really important from exchanges because that also means that your distribution for this, this new narrative is gonna be out there, right? New players can get involved, a lot of retailers can get involved. And once retailers get involved, that that's, 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 that's when the market really picks up. I, I, was, uh, I was very listening very keenly on your answers because uh, for us, it's also not easy to choose, right? Like we don't know, you know, like I said earlier, right? We listen, we build for our users, right? And we listen to our users. And so part of it is that community aspect, but also technically has to work, right? Like we can't, we, we can't support something that's still technically immature, right? At the scale of which, you know, depositing, even just on the deposit and withdrawal side, it, it has to be scalable. Otherwise, you know, it, it, we're gonna run into some major issues. So that's where we can't be too early. Uh, I'm talking about the centralized exchange uh, perspective. So. I was hoping for more definitive answers between all those protocols, but uh, it looks like I'll have to wait. Also, hey, no investment advice allowed here. That's why we're not naming things. I, I can't be like, as VC, you gotta be as neutral as possible, right? <laughs> Tyler, were you going to say something? Or we uh, yeah, I was just going to add that. I think that the arms race is really starting around these protocols too for like uh, functionality. Like right now, they basically all do the same thing in terms of like mid transfer. Like they kind of follow the spec that Domo pioneered with PRC20, um, which has done incredibly well. But now, now that the user base has grown, there's demand for people to do, uh, you know, like staking and more type of smart contract functionality and so whether that gets implemented on l2s or whether that gets implemented on the kind of meta protocol indexer level uh with some of these tokens or uh, however that gets architected i think that's where uh the the founders i talk to are looking is like where where can i actually add more and more functionality and more you know mechanics games, uh, incentives around the token. Uh, but I, I do think in, in all that, um, it's important not to miss like the free mint um, aspect of BRC20, which is what I think really made this so popular that it was like a open, democratized, equal access thing that anyone, anyone could mint. Yeah, absolutely. Like any technological kind of cycle, you need a mechanism to essentially bootstrap whether it's liquidity, whether it's speculation or hype, but once you have the capital in there, that's when you can fund a continuous innovation to, to continue and to, to do that. Um, 
And okay, switching gear a little bit and tie to the topic of the panel here. How do you define utility of BTC now and potentially in the future? Like, what does it even mean? Besides just people trading, right? That's a utility. Um, so, th the way I look at this is that historically, um, you know, when we first started, I mean, specifically on NFTs and ordinals, um, it, it actually started on Bitcoin, right? Because there was color coin. Right, and then that didn't scale, and so we we moved on to 721s, and then a bunch of other like EVM chains just basically you know got involved because of faster, more efficient. Um, they had different benefits, and then now we're back back on Bitcoin because there were certain things that Bitcoin could do, could do or serve that other chains couldn't do, um, and, and I made that example through like for, for example like the value right. Um, so the question now is. Uh, as 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 investors, what else can we do other than just investing on ordinals? And the way I look at it is like a 3D chart. Is that Bitcoin will be the like UTXO model, and then below that there's going to be several layers that can that's literally developed for very specific use cases. And then around that entire layer, outside of Bitcoin, remember there's still Litecoin, there's still Dogecoin. I mean, right now, no one's talking about like DRC20, but I'm pretty sure that's gonna be a thing in the future. Like, if I'm running a meme coin, like, I don't wanna be a Solana. I wanna be on Dogecoin, man, right? Like, that's the future, that's, that's, that's OG, right? So, that's DJ. So, no one has opened that market yet, right? I mean, Elon Musk talked about like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pro Dogecoin because it has no, no, no utility. I mean, he was right a, a couple, like, a year ago, but did he foresee that this is gonna be a thing in the future? I doubt it, right? So things are changing, and as more layers are being built on top of various bond UTXO, we're gonna have more choices, and the market will speak for itself. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking. Oh, go ahead. No, I was thinking out loud, but you speak first. No, I, uh, just on the question of uh, Bitcoin utility, I think obviously the store value aspect, the payments aspects, I think that's all kind of well understood. Um, from our perspective, our approach is we're open to the market, right? We wanna see what the market is uh, demanding and we wanna provide it. Um, and so, you know, as an exchange, we were pretty early to supporting SegWit, for example, Taproot, uh, when, when that came about, uh, Lightning, uh, you know, over almost almost three years ago now, Lightning support. And then, uh, you know, now with Ordinals, um, but we're also doing things like making sure the developers out there, especially the open source developers out there, uh, get the support that they have to continue to build out the utility stack. Um, so we've given out almost $2 million to uh, Bitcoin open source developers over the past four years, and we expect to continue to do that. So I think from our perspective as an exchange, because we touch so many points along that development cycle, um, you know, again, I'm here to learn about what's coming next, so uh, we, we can keep an eye, eye on it. I gotta give a huge shout out to OKX for their support of uh, Bitcoin core development. They really have been kind of leading the way and, and funding a lot of uh, super cool stuff on, on Bitcoin. Um, and then when it comes to the utility question, you know, uh, what's great about Bitcoin is that it's many things to many people and you can use it however you want as, you, as long as you follow the, the consensus rules. And so, you know, we've invested in companies that uh, are, are focused on it as a store of value, like custodians or insurance or you know uh, uh, secure your Bitcoin for generations we've invested in companies that are focused on the payments lightning micropayments uh, you know remittances global money use case and now with this new wave uh, we're uh, investing in in stuff uh, companies and really an ecosystem where Bitcoin is the unit of account like all these assets are priced in sats and in order to buy any of these assets living on the Bitcoin network now, you have to have Bitcoin. Your, your credit card does you no good here. So it truly is like a new, truly Bitcoin native economy that's emerged around ordinals, around uh, these token standards on top of Bitcoin, where Bitcoin is the only way to play the game. It's, you know, to use the analogy from earlier, it's the only poker chips that are accepted at the, ca the casino and where you can do all sorts of, all the degeneracy you want without ever leaving Bitcoin. And I think that's a great thing. Yeah, 
want to share my answer here also. Like, as I was asking, I was like, what will be my response? So what is the product or sort of the utility of any chain at all? It's, it's the block space, right? It's the security decentralization of data stored on chain that's globally accessible. And arguably, well, actually, no, it's, it's disputable that Bitcoin has the most uh, premium block space of all. But the utility and the gap to achieve that utility is incredibly hard to use, well, because of the script language constraints or because of the block time. So to me, the definition of investing utility of BTC is just to what can we invest in to facilitate the adoption, the usage of Bitcoin as a block space? So, no, just you know, think out loud. I wanted to share my perspective here. I agree. I agree. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. Going to my next question. Um, I have a lot of questions. So just uh, going through. <laughs> cool. So, the path to a top option or the path to kind of investing. How, I mean, you guys have been seasoned investor for a while and see kind of the Ethereum, Solana, you know, Avalanche, EVM, all the chain evolve. How, what's been the idiosyncrasies of BTC uh, investment, whether it's you know, timeline um, to TGE or you know, the, the topic to be built, like kind of what's the sauce, secret sauce there? Like how is BTC ecosystem investing different from the rest? I'm going to give this to Kevin. <laughs> That's a great question. I think from, um, from the Bitcoin Frontier Fund's perspective, because we run an accelerator, a lot of the companies that go through the accelerator are a little bit more early. Um, and I think the, the interesting thing is a lot of these founders, I think in the last cohort, didn't really have the infrastructure to even be able to build some of the things that they wanted to build. And now, that we are where we are now, I think some of that core infrastructure has been built. Still some more to do, but I think it has been built. So great wallets are out there, like one of our investments experts. We have great inscription services like Ormel's bot, and we have even a DeFi platform, like Liquidity, um, who we're all investors in. So I think now some of the core infrastructure pieces, some of the core DeFi pieces are starting to come into play, and it's gonna allow other things to be built on top. So when we're looking at what is next, right, it's always looking at one kind of super specialized uh, diamonds, I will say. I think our, the, the rare stats are gonna be really interesting coming into the new year. That's, that's one narrative that I'm very, very interested on. I see Tyler shaking his head as well. Um, and, the second thing, and the second thing that I think gonna be, it's gonna be, I think, the year of DeFi in my perspective. And I think a lot of things are gonna start potentially moving onto a layer two in the next coming year as well. And this is where I think potentially stacks with the Nakamoto upgrade, with SBTC, with liquid stacks, and some of the bridging that's already happening between ordinals and stacks is gonna have a really strong narrative coming into the next year. Love it. Um, you know, that touch on a pretty good segue into, you know, what, what's exciting, like what are you tracking? Since we're, we're starting to talk about Alpha already, um, Tyler. Ooh, uh, uh, I think rare stats are, are very interesting to uh, put an exclamation part, uh, point on that, and we're seeing a lot of people building uh, new things around those. Um, uh, I agree with Kevin on, on DeFi, like all sorts of the financial mechanics, money Legos, uh, all that sort of stuff there's demand for it on, on Bitcoin. So basically ways to let people speculate even more uh, than they are today um, and, and borrow, lend, futures, options, perpetual swaps. I think all of that is gonna come to Bitcoin. I think um, <clears throat> you know a, a place where we're paying a lot of attention and, and have made a number of bets too, it's really on the layer two side. Um, what is you know really uh, critical for uh, layer twos in the, the Bitcoin ecosystem is unlike on Ethereum uh, or other chains where the layer twos are really about just scalability and, and uh, you know uh, adding more transaction throughput. Bitcoin needs layer twos to add a lot of functionality. And so um, I think it's really fascinating to see the kind of the Bitcoin and the Ethereum scaling roadmaps start to converge once again after 
five or six years where now both of them are, are kind of serving as like a data availability layer for rollups and ZK uh, stuff um, that gives you way better scalability than you ever can uh, on the, the biggest, fastest L1. Tyler, can you uh, name some L2s that you're excited about on Bitcoin? I can, I can at least drop the, uh, the ones that we've invested in. Um, uh, a, a couple uh, botanics labs, uh, super, super great team. Um, they are building uh, an EVM uh, L2 uh, that works with MetaMask, uh, where Bitcoin is the native token. You pay gas fees on, on Bitcoin and have come up with a new bridge called a spider chain. I think it's pretty innovative. They're on testnet. Uh, they'll be coming to mainnet, I think, early next year. Um, we've made an investment in uh, Bison Labs, which is a kind of Starkware-inspired uh, L2, specifically for BRC20 tokens. Uh, their launch application is going to be a, a AMM DEX kind of Uniswap style for BRC20 tokens, um, and I've been playing with it on testnet. Super, super fast, super cheap. It went uh, live. It went live. You're not supposed to share that. <laughs> that that's the alpha. But uh, and then Taproot Wizards, another one um, we've invested in. I'd also encourage people to check out uh, Chainway, uh, Alpin Labs, uh, L2O. Uh, I think that's that's most of my list right now. There's a B squared also recently. Yeah, B squared. Yeah. So, I love your you know diving deep into these projects. What's the evaluation process on the OKX side? To, to which one do we support? Yeah, first is to show up on a panel so I could learn a few things, number one. Uh, no, uh, 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 you know, from our perspective, like I said, you know, there's the user perspective, but also the readiness perspective, right? Um, our goal ultimately is to provide our users and users broadly easy access. That's, that's our goal, right? And so we want users to, whether it's getting your first Bitcoin, getting your first crypto, and graduating through all the way to being on chain and, and interacting with some of these uh, cool, cool protocols and dApps, that's our job, and uh, so, you know, whatever our users are looking for, we're, we're there to provide it. That's what we like to hear. All right, nine minutes left. Let's, let's talk about something more tactical for the founders sitting here. Um, what's your favorite question to ask as you take these deal calls? Uh, what you're looking for from those questions? And maybe that turns into some advice for, for the founders sitting here. I'll start with mines, since it seems like they need a minute to think about. <laughs> um, mines usually, what are the alternatives today that um, that can achieve similar goals? And then is, like how how is the pain point um, sufficient to warrant another solution? Because there is switch cost. So I would say one piece of advice I give to founders, like definitely show the breadth of your competitive analysis and competitors are not just in Web3 competitors, but also like Web2 existing competitor. Like you, you, it, it needs to reach just be, be comprehensive. Like it shows you did your homework, deep understanding of the space, and really helps me grasp why is this worth investing in. So that's why. Uh, for us, we, we look back at the fundamentals, right? So it depends on whether that product is more of an application layer or more of a protocol layer. Um, so, for example, if it's an application layer, I think fundamentally you got to ask yourself, like, is this something that you would use? Is this something that's real, solving a real issue? And if it is, then there, there, usually there's also some token incentive that would drive that use case, like, you know, from, um, you know, from like zero to one. Um, the, for the for protocol level, we also we're most focused on on the developer community. So, like, like I said, right? For example. Uh, we will do most of the research from their Discord, from their Twitter, um, how active their communities are, uh, whether that, that those are organic, like why fundamentally they're more popular than other ones. Again, because it's so early, most of these are still in the stage of development, so there's obviously less um, ways to um, evaluate the success of the project compared to Ethereum and Solana projects. But generally, I think because the market is so early, the alpha is insane. Um, this is how like we were doing the approach. The first two questions that I always ask if uh, somebody gets introduced to me is um, pitch deck and data room. And it's very surprising how many founders who are building in this space don't have a data room. 
Like, I, I'm actually surprised. And it doesn't need to be anything like, you know, fancy, but it is a core component of at least our due diligence process at the Bitcoin Frontier Fund. But one of the key things that I always look at on the pitch deck is the market sizing. And it's very common to see market sizing of this is where Bitcoin stuff is and then this is where Ethereum stuff is, right? You got that little tiny dot with the giant circle. And that's not good enough. Like, I want to know a little bit more how you think about the market, how you think about how you can actually get existing Bitcoin users and new Bitcoin users to utilize your product. And I want you to put numbers around that. It's never going to be perfect. We all know that. But we at least want to go through the exercise of understanding how you are thinking about your particular product. I just want to note that Kevin's fund, that they invest like super early. Yes. Yeah, so they do think very differently from us where we're a little more at the later stage of Bitcoin companies. I'd say uh, we kind of sit in the middle between both of these guys. Uh, for me, what I really like to focus on uh, is around distribution. There's the old adage that first time founders focus on product or tech, second time founders focus on distribution and go to market. So, you know, um, I think that's something uh, we've all learned in crypto that it's not always the most shiniest, elegant technology that works. BRC20 is a great example of that, but if you've got distribution, um, that's, uh, you know, can build a real, real moat around your product. And, and not a VC. <laughs> I think uh, he's bigger than the VCs. <laughs> I think like one thing that, I don't know about you guys, but for, for me, like really the, the most important thing outside of everything that I just said really is the team. You know, it's like, can I connect with the team? Does the team have prior experience building something? in the Bitcoin space. If they don't, do they come from a Web3 background, a Web2 background? For me, because we are so early and we are probably earlier than the both of you guys, is the team is like the most important thing. So if you're taking a call like with a super early stage investor, it's all about the relationship. Yes, we want to know your credentials, we want to know what you've built, but the core of everything is really the relationships that you're building with your potential investors. Yeah, exactly. And kind of to my earlier point, also the demonstration of your deep understanding of the space. And I kid you not, I have passed on deals where the like first page is, we are the only solution on XYZ. And I'm like, homework needs to be done. We will work on this. But um, yeah, that's really important. And that's actually, you know, since we have four minutes left, what not to do? Like, what are the common pitfalls of be like instantly, sorry, this is going to be a hot take, but instantly turn you off. For me, it's like, we are the only, we are the first. <laughs> There's always others. Super high valuations. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point though. Like it's always a, at an um, uh, invisible hand of, um, even if you set something and this deal gets really hot, people will bit you up. So don't, don't necessarily need to be greedy to set something up there. You rather want to have a lot of people chase you and elevate your allegation than the other way around, right? I think, would you guys agree? Yeah, I think it's a lot easier to, to ask the question, like, what don't you like, or what are some of the red flags that usually happen? I think it's the same thing with relationship, right? It's hard, it's like, I think the, the idea here is, for, for us, it's mostly, because the, the space is moving so fast, and just on BRC20 today, I mean, if you, you know, like three months ago, like, people weren't even thinking about this. And now, like a lot of more Bitcoin companies are looking to adopt BRC20. Um, but what we did realize is that because previously they were not kind of like trained to think that way, um, a lot of them are still like figuring out like if, if this is possible. A lot of them are based in the U.S. They're kind of concerned like where to like set up their entities. S sometimes you ask yourself, well, if you guys have been in Web3 for a long time, like shouldn't you be this stuff? But you know, at the same time, like I, I realized that because we're coming from an ecosystem that's like totally different. Like we've been investing in like. Ethereum for the longest time, and then a lot of the, the Bitcoin guys are, I think they're from mostly stacks, right? And so um, there's like, they're, the ecosystem is still early. There's, again, nothing against stacks, it's just they're early compared to Ethereum, right? And so um, naturally, you, you have to set a, a different approach than working with entrepreneurs from that space. Maybe I can add, just add one, one point. We're not, we're not a VC, we do have a venture arm, but we're not, that's not our, our main uh, 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 you know, business. But um, I think we do also encourage uh, projects and you know, to come talk to us, though. I mean, 
it sometimes takes us a little bit longer uh, to understand the value and, and what you guys are building. Um, and because we have to, again, frame it in the mind of, uh, you know, connecting you guys to the, the users, right? And so, um, you know, we're, we're always happy to chat. Um, I don't have tough questions like these guys do, or, or data room requirements, but uh, you know, we're always happy to check. D data room is very rare in our space. <laughs> yeah. All right, debate, debate right now yeah, on data yeah. rooms. Yeah. I mean, the only data rooms I've seen are like probably funds, like funds of funds. <laughs> really? You think it's? It, yeah, it's really rare. I mean, like an incorporation document, a cap table. Uh, oh, uh, even cap table. Like some sometimes when we meet investors, like oh, uh, we can only really share like these guys. Uh, some, some of them are like, oh, we have a cap table, we're not willing to share all the investors kind of thing. Um, or like, um, or like uh, we can share with you verbally, but we, we, we don't have a document for that. Um, I think it also, it, it also kind of shows that there's so much, like the space is moving so fast. Right, if you, if you, during the bear market especially, you can ask for all this stuff. And you can spend like weeks doing the diligence on deal, and they're, happy, like, they're more than happy to like, spend this time with you. When the market is hot, like, you know, back then when I was in the early days of like, Ethereum, we were investing like four deals a day. <laughs> right, literally four deals a day. So this feels a bit like that in the sense that we're doing like two deals a week kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it all depends on the definition, like what is data room? Um, but I think the like, takeaway is um, provide more data points, provide more information that's helpful and present them in a organized fashion to help your investors look for it easily. Like if it's a pre-seed fund, which we specialize in, like th there's not a lot of you know data to show, but at least it shows you try uh, and try to be organized, and structured. Uh, with that said, um, thank you all for for this amazing panel, and uh, look forward to chat with all of you um, up out there. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you.